Welcome to Focus on Abilities, a program about issues affecting the lives of people with disabilities. I'm Lex Frieden, I'll be your host for today's program. I'm a professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, and I direct the Southwest ADA Center and the Independent Living Research Utilization Program at Tier Memorial Hermann. We have a great guest today, and I'll introduce her after we take a short break. But before we do, I want to ask you a question, one that we'll answer before the end of today's program. That is, what number can you call to get technical assistance about the ADA? We'll be right back after this short break with our guest today, so please stay tuned to Focus on Abilities. The following program is sponsored by ILRU, Southwest ADA Center, promoting compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. This is Focus on Abilities, and I'm Lex Frieden. Today we've got a great guest, and I want to introduce her now. Uh, this is Debbie Jones from the Southwest ADA Center. Uh, Debbie, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you for having me. So Debbie, I, I, I outed you. You work for the Southwest ADA Center. Yes. And what's your job there? I'm an ADA information specialist. So I answer the phone and, and give people information and resources related to the ADA. Do you do on-site training as well? Yes, um, kind of whatever people ask for related to the ADA, we're available for that. And when you say related to the ADA, ADA is a big law. I think the last time I counted it was 52 pages long. Yeah. And it has several sections that deal with all kinds of issues people face in life. Are you an expert on all those issues? Indeed. Well. Um, I will tell you, I, I joined the ADA Center um, a little over two years ago, and I came from a, a background in education, so I knew how the ADA applies to education and then Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and how that applies to education, but I really did not know when I, when I came into the role how vast the ADA is as a law and all the different areas that it covers. So it, it has taken me a while to learn all the nooks and crannies of the ADA. Um, there are some number of questions that I can answer at this point pretty easily. Um, and then there are a few details that I'm going to have to go do some research to figure out exactly what I, you know, what's the right answer for someone's particular question. I'm going to throw a few questions at you in a little bit. Okay. But uh, uh, before we do that, I, you mentioned uh, Section 504, mm -hmm. which is a part of Title V, which is a part of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when people think about disability rights, I think most people think about the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, which was signed by President Bush July 26, 1990. But long time before that, 1973, Congress passed and the President signed the, uh, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which included a Title V. What all does that Title V cover that was actually here before the ADA? Well, it, it covers uh, appropriate access to students with disabilities. But it also covers uh, government buildings, government facilities, employment by government agencies, and other organizations that uh, receive government funds, right? True, but it, it wasn't as broad as the ADA. Got it. Um, and I don't think it was used as much as the ADA. I don't think it got enough uh, recognition and people didn't know they had rights that were covered under Section Title V and Section 503, 504, 505. Uh, in fact, it took, uh, as I recall, five years for the government to write regulations about uh, Title V, and during that time, nobody could take any action based on it anyway. Yeah. Mm. So there were, were uh, uh, I don't 
want to call them riots, but public action, social action by people with disabilities, even civil dif disobedience sure. during that time because people were being frustrated. They, their rights were protected, but they couldn't enact any, um, do anything to, to have that checked or, or invoked or anything else. Um, that, that doesn't affect us today, does it? How so? In the, in the fact that we, we do now have regulations and people know how to use them. Oh, yes, yes. Um, compliance is still sometimes an issue, though. Um, and those are a lot of the calls that we get. Uh, people are concerned or questioning about whether uh, a particular circumstance is in compliance under the ADA. And, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. And if, if that's the case, then we will help them find avenues to um, file a complaint, to make some adjustment, to address it with the correct person, to see how they can make the circumstance better. So people are generally aware of the ADA. Employers, uh, mom and pop, people with disabilities, generally aware, but they're not sure exactly what all is covered and how to invoke their rights. Right. Um, I think some people also have an idea that the ADA is a, uh, an edifice or, you know, they're going to call the ADA um, as an advocacy organization somehow. So we need to help educate people to understand that it is a law that um, different agencies will uh, enforce we'll look at compliance for, um, but it isn't, it isn't actually a, a thing to call, per se. But you can call for help. But you can call for it. help, and when they call us, they've called the right place. All right, we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, you worked for 20 years for a private university, mm -hmm. and during that time, you interacted with a lot of students who had disabilities, mm -hmm. and probably administrators and instructors who were less informed perhaps than even the students, right? Right. Um, well, it's come a long way. I think it's, it's certainly people are more informed than they used to be. Um, I came into the university as a, as a licensed mental health counselor and had no idea that at one point I would be administering disability services to college students. So um, I had to ramp up my knowledge at that point uh, about the ADA and, and 504. Um, and it's, it's great work. Um, students who come in with disabilities want to go to school. They want to do well. Mm -hmm. And um, by and large, they just want access. They don't, you know, it, it's not burdensome what people want. What kind of barriers do they run into? Well, um, the, the most common issue is not having enough time to take a test for whatever reason. Um, people may have a processing speed issue, they may have physical disabilities that just require extra time, so they need extra time to take a test. And facilitating that shouldn't be a very difficult thing to do. Um, and I think at this point it's, it's pretty much not. It's a, it's a the number one accommodation across the board, I think, for college students. At In this my point. experience, and this dates back literally decades, uh, maybe half a century, I, when I was a student and needed extra time, nobody offered it to me. Mm. But when I suggested it might be helpful because I had so much difficulty writing, um, I was told I had the same time as everybody else. Ah. And they really weren't aware of making accommodations then. So I'm glad to hear you say that we've made progress Great among strides, our yes. knowledge. I want to talk more about the kind of accommodations that students need and people in the workforce. Uh, but we're going to take a break from focus here for a second. And I'd like for you all to stay tuned. We'll be back with Debbie Jones and more focus in a minute. shared with loved ones are precious. Joy, enchantment, connection. It's why we travel. At Houston airports, we know the magic of flight begins the moment you secure your parking spot and embark on your journey. That's why we work so hard to bring you the most convenient parking solutions that are the best fit for your trip. If you're traveling for business or leisure, 
Whether your voyage starts from Bush Intercontinental or William P. Hobby Airport, our parking team at Valley Parking, Eco Park, Eco Park 2, or Terminal Parking is here to give you a first-class experience with a big Texas smile. We're here for you to ensure this moment and every moment in between will be filled with great memories that will last a lifetime. So travel smarter, park smarter, and get more of the moments that matter. You're watching Focus on Abilities on HTV. Our guest today is Debbie Jones. And Debbie, we've been talking a little bit about the kind of accommodations that universities and schools make uh, for people with disabilities. Do you find, I mean, in that prior role uh, where you were responsible for assisting students on campus, do you find that many of them don't come to you until after they've been affected by their disability in the classroom, or do most of them uh, reveal when they enter, when they, when they enroll, what their issues might be? Well, that's interesting because um, there are many students that come to college having had a, a, a 504 plan uh, K through 12. So they have been aware of their particular diagnosis of, of their academic challenges and they come straight away to the Disability Services Office to set up academic accommodations for college. Mm. Um, there are some students that are, that are in that circumstance and have decided, well, they want to try college without any accommodations. They want to see how they do because they feel like they've got enough tools. And so they don't come right away, and that is their right. Um, one message, a bad message that, that was out there several years ago um, was that students had to have a particular timeline. They had to uh, tell their professors or, or uh, pr present themselves to the Disability Services Office like within two weeks of starting school. And if they didn't hit that two week timeline, then they wouldn't be accommodated, uh -oh. which um, the ADA says is not appropriate. Um, students should have the ability to come in whenever they want for accommodations within reason. Um, if a student decides that, um, you know, the day before, two days before their final exam that they want accommodations on that exam, it, it's possible that you know, they're not going to be able to do that logistically. Well, it depends on what accommodation they're requesting. Exactly. If it's a little more time, maybe that's easier done, then they need some special equipment or a special application for their computer. Absolutely, so. absolutely. Um, but what is unique about the uh, sort of the industry of disability services in higher education is that the, the providers, the people who administer um, academic accommodations, kind of have to walk a fine line between what students need and then what the institution needs. So professors have what's called academic freedom. They're able to create their courses and decide um, what objectives they're, they're trying to measure and um, how many assignments, et cetera, all of that. Um, and, and this is meant to be a reasonable thing. I mean, we're hoping that professors are being reasonable in terms of, of designing their courses. And there are times that uh, an accommodation that a student will request might run up against the professor's objectors in that course. So the disability service provider has to kind of be a moderator there to you know, talk to the professor, what is it that you need, what is it that you expect, and then talk to the student about how can we address your needs and still have you achieve the goal of completing the course. So an example might be uh, a course where students are required to look through a microscope and identify certain bugs and that person's not able uh, because of their vision or because of their uh, mobility to actually look through a microscope. Mm -hmm. That would be an example where the professor might not think offhand of the solution to that. What would you, in your case, if you were counseling the professor and the student, what would you suggest? Well, I can think of a couple of options for that. One would be some nice new equipment that would uh, help an individual be able to see, maybe an offset lens, something that would be 
you know, uh, accessible to them, or possibly a, uh, a lab assistant, someone who could describe for them um, what's being seen and then have the individual make an assessment based on those facts. Back in the day, again, when I was a student, the accommodation that was made, and I appreciated it, was the professor actually took photographs through the lens of various samples, and then I used the photographs to identify or to practice what I had learned through the book and the lectures. So that was, that was pretty cheap and easy accommodation, and that right? And that was an enlightened professor uh, that, who did that for you. Enlightenment is the key, I think, yeah, to a I lot agree. of sol problem solving. I, you know, I'm surprised at some of the stories I hear from schools, even now, mm -hmm. about uh, faculty who don't really understand and appreciate uh, the possibilities of accommodations or the way in which they might be provided. Yeah. Uh, did you, in that prior role, ever hear complaints or do you in your current role as an ADA advisor hear complaints about the cost of reasonable accommodation? Oh, sure. Uh, from administrators that, you know, they see a, a dollar figure and, and, you know, become upset or anxious about that. And um, they have to understand that it's the, it's the whole institution that is obligated to, to pay for whatever it is. And, um, you know, the federal, the federal government, if they come to investigate, if there's a complaint, they're looking at um, all the money, the, you know, the whole kitty that the, that the university has. Um, it isn't just the operating budget of the disability services office or, you know, whatever. So um, it's really hard for a, for a school um, it, to claim an undue burden for a piece but, of equipment. But there may be a case with a small school where a student needs an elevator and it doesn't exist. Yeah. In that case, perhaps the university could propose moving the classroom downstairs. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely or to another building. So th that's where I think it's imperative that uh, rather than have a kind of a gut reaction, no, that administrators, managers, owners, whoever, stop and think about the concept of reasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. How do you describe that when you're doing technical assistance? To uh, reasonable accommodation, what's it mean? To people who are calling like parents or, or something? Not to, uh, uh, store owners or or uh, school administrators well it is uh, I mean just as a general concept it's about allowing a person with a disability to access um, whatever the goods services program are um, in the most effective way that they can but a reasonable accommodation would mean they have options about the way they uh, provide those accommodations, right? They do. Um, uh, someone may request an accommodation in a certain way, and and that may not be uh, that may not be easy to do because of whatever the circumstances are for the business, um, and an alternative could be could be provided. Right, but that has to be negotiated with and suitable for the student or the employee in right. those cases. As an interactive process. Right, good yeah. Good point. Thank you, Debbie. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take another break from Focus on Abilities, but when we come back, I want to answer the question that we ask at the beginning of the show and uh, also see if you have some additional advice for people with disabilities who are looking for accommodations. We'll be We'll be right back with uh, Focus on Abilities after this short break. St. Arnold, Texas's oldest craft brewery, shipped their first keg of beer in 1994. Downtown is an art lover's dream with more than 65 pieces of public art. This is Focus on Abilities. I'm Lex Frieden. Debbie Jones is our guest today, and we're talking about accommodations. Uh, Debbie, you're an expert now because you work for the Southwest ADA Center. Uh, you answer phone calls from Texas and the one, two, three, four 
adjacent states, right? right New right. Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Right. Uh, which of those states produce the most calls that you've responded to? I would say Texas and New Mexico. Texas and New Mexico. Probably. And are the issues that are raised in Texas different from those raised in the other four states? Hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, they're all, every phone call feels like it's different. Wow. And it will, in that respect, what is the, I, it's hard for me to ask the question now that you've said that, what is the most frequent uh, request for information you get? You know, I would say it has to do with animals. I would say um, we are a country that loves our animals. And I think people uh, want to know about service dogs and they want to know about emotional support animals and they want to know what the difference is and they want to know if they should pay for certification of these animals on the internet uh, and I'm always happy to catch them before they do that. So you, I mean, you've just opened the, the Python's box. Yeah. yeah. So d d d we can't continue until you tell us it, is everybody eligible for a service animal and are emotional support animals covered under the ADA? They are not. Emotional support animals are covered under the Fair Housing Act. Um, so people can have an emotional support animal if they're renting in an apartment. Um, there's a process they need to go through uh, to, to be approved for that. Um, under the ADA, it would be possible under Title I that an employee might request an emotional support animal as a reasonable accommodation to bring to work. Um, I don't know how common that is, and employers do have the ability to say, no, you can't bring an animal because it would be disruptive to our particular workplace, whatever that is, but, but that, I think that's the only place under the ADA that it might be possible for an emotional support animal to be considered. So, but, but the animals that are protected mm -hmm. under the ADA routinely are service animals, Trained right? Trained service dogs, right. And, and is that only dogs? Uh, I think 99.9% .9 of the time it is dogs. Um, there are um, a very few miniature horses in the country. I have not seen one uh, nor heard about one in Texas. I would love to see one one day. Um, yeah, but well that, there was actually a famous case where one was actually taken on an aircraft. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. We well, can go back in history for that one. But yeah. the, uh, the service dogs then are available, I mean, they, they can assist somebody in virtually any circumstances, right? Right, yes, unless uh, they would present some sort of danger or they would be in some sort of danger, uh, but for the most part, any place their handler can go, they can go a, to. What's a legit service dog? Because uh, some people would say their dogs are service animals, and in fact, I think they can buy a sticker for their dog on the internet. Yeah, that sticker's not legit. Um, unfortunately, the law does, does not require any kind of certification or um, identification for a service dog, but their behavior is a, a significant marker that you can tell that this is actually a service dog. They need to be very, very well trained, and they specifically need to be trained to do a particular task or more. So if I'm a restaurant tour, and somebody comes to the restaurant with an animal, dog in this case, mm -hmm. and intends to bring that in, and I've not uh, been trained or versed on how you deal with disabled people bringing dogs. Mm -hmm. What can I say besides that's not allowed, which would wind up having me the subject of a federal complaint? Right, that would be non-compliant. Um, people are allowed to ask two questions. Um, when they see someone with a dog, they can say, is this dog needed for a disability? If it's not obvious, if the person doesn't have an obvious physical disability of some kind, um, because if that's the case, then they, there really wouldn't be any reason to ask. Um, if their disability isn't obvious, they can say, is this dog needed for a disability? They cannot ask, what is your diagnosis? Or, you know, why do you need this dog? Um, if they say yes, then the next question is, what task or job has this dog been trained to do for you? And it, and it should be a legitimate task that a dog would have to be trained to do. Um, 
just you know l licking them when they're feeling anxious is not something that you would train a dog to do that would be something that a pet would do so give me an example of something they could be trained to do that would be helpful to me um, so, uh, dogs can be trained to to open doors to pick things up that have been dropped to um, scout the way ahead to be sure that it's clear um, I think it's fascinating when dogs have been trained to detect blood sugar levels for people with diabetes um, or to detect um, the, uh, the coming of a, uh, of a seizure. Um, I think that takes a huge amount of training and a very talented dog to be able to detect but subtle But they're able to be trained to do levels. that. Yeah, they absolutely are. Okay, that's good information. If people you know, are interested more in this subject, or in any subjects related to the ADA compliance, and it could be a, a restaurant manager, it could be a store manager, it could be a person with a disability, any kind of a disability, mm -hmm. a family member of a person with a disability, or somebody that just sees something that doesn't look right. Uh, they can call before they have to call the Department of Justice, they can call the ADA technical assistance line. And at the beginning of the show, I said that we'll reveal the answer to the question. I, this is one where I actually know the answer. 1-800-9494-ADA. And that, that Debbie is, translates to 1-800-949-4232. Um, are they apt to reach you if they call that number? We have a team and uh, we rotate around uh, who's answering, so uh, it might be me or it might be one of my colleagues. And if you don't know the answer, you might transfer them to another specialist, right? I, I might, or I might tell them I'm gonna get back to them and do some research and then call them back. So they also have the right to file a complaint with the uh, Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. How do they do that? Uh, there are online forms that people can fill out. There are phone numbers to call. Um, if they can't uh, do it online, um, faxing. I mean, there's, there are a lot of avenues to get a complaint to the Department of Justice. And locally, they can call the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, which represents the Department of Justice in, in local regions. So, and I, you know, I'm a fan of the U.S. Attorneys because they, uh, they take action and they get changes made. Um, if you see a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or if you see somebody's uh, disability uh, fi reaching discrimination anyway, if you see somebody in a parking lot that doesn't belong in a space, uh, see something, you say something, you don't have to have a disability to complain. And uh, Debbie, they can call you if they want to verify that. Absolutely. Or they can just uh, inform the, the uh, Department of Justice and they'll eventually investigate it depending on how many people it affects and how much time they have and so on. There may be state avenues to follow for complaints as well. Okay, they can learn about that by reaching the ADA Center at 1-800-949-4232. Uh, I should add here that anybody who's watching this program anywhere in the United States can call that number because the same number will be answered by an ADA technical assistant in your federal region, one near you. Uh, so you may not reach Debbie and her colleagues in Houston, but you will reach somebody on that 800-949-4232 phone number. Use it, uh, use it liberally whenever you need accommodation assistance or other information about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Debbie, I want to thank you so much for being our guest today on Focus on Abilities. Thank you, I Max. hope you come back again and tell us more about what you learn as you do your job. Absolutely. All right. Thank all of you for watching Focus on Abilities. Uh, this show is produced by HTV. It's available to you via the City of Houston website or online via YouTube. And uh, we'd be glad to have you come back next time to watch more. This has been a production of HTV, and I'm Lex Frieden, your host. Please tune in next time for more Focus on Abilities.